This government will not hesitate in meeting its primary obligations, which are to the security of our nation. The family of Lee Harvey Oswald has received little attention in the years since he was accused of assassinating President John F. Kennedy. And when you get to hear about the story of his mother, you would probably understand why. In the aftermath of JFK's assassination, his mother, Marguerite Oswald, was in the midst of discussions as she turned to seeking publicity and cash years later after her son's death, making several revelations regarding the JFK assassination. In today's video, we'll delve into the bizarre things Lee Harvey Oswald's mother did after JFK's assassination, unraveling the mysteries behind the assassination of the 35th President of the United States. Following the assassination of JFK, the enigma surrounding JFK's death can be traced back to November 21, 1963, when President John F. Kennedy traveled to Fort Worth, Texas, for a campaign event. The pivotal moment occurred on the following day, November 22, as JFK, accompanied by his wife and Texas Governor John Connolly, paraded through enthusiastic crowds in downtown Dallas inside the Lincoln Continental convertible vehicle, the turning point transpired from an upstairs window of the Texas School Book Depository Building, where a 24-year-old warehouse worker named Lee Harvey Oswald, a former U.S. Marine, allegedly aimed and fired upon the presidential vehicle, striking JFK twice. The president succumbed to his injuries at Parkland Memorial Hospital shortly afterward, marking the tragic end of his life at the age of 46. In the aftermath of President Kennedy's tragic death, the nation was further shaken when Jack Ruby, a Dallas nightclub owner, assassinated Lee Harvey Oswald as he was being transferred between jails. The profound impact of JFK's assassination remains etched in the collective memory of many, with people recalling the exact moment they learned of this unspeakable national tragedy. Despite the persistent emergence of conspiracy theories surrounding Kennedy's death, the official account proposes that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. However, for a significant portion of the American population, this explanation is far from satisfactory. The dissatisfaction stems not only from the official investigation's obfuscation and omission of information, but also from a deeper, unmet need for a more comprehensive understanding. To grasp the complexity of this sentiment, one must delve into the various alternative theories circulating about the identity of JFK's assassin. Meanwhile, every single conspiracy theory out there has been the subject of exhaustive books, documentaries, feature films, and far too many podcasts. The Mafia Connection with JFK Assassination The Mafia, particularly the Chicago outfit, features prominently in numerous conspiracy theories surrounding the JFK assassination often depicted either as the sole perpetrator or part of a more extensive conspiracy network. The question arises, what motivations could the Mafia have had to target John F. Kennedy? Speculations suggest possible grievances stemming from the closure of their casinos in Cuba, or perhaps a connection through JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, who amassed wealth as a bootlegger. A compelling argument supporting the idea of the Mafia targeting JFK revolves around then-Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, JFK's brother. Robert had actively pursued the dismantling of organized crime, publicly challenging Teamsters leader Jimmy Hoffa for his connections to various mob figures. During this period, organized crime had successfully infiltrated numerous labor unions. Conspiracy theorists highlight Jack Ruby's involvement in the JFK narrative, as he shot Lee Harvey Oswald on the 24th of November, while Oswald was being paraded in police custody. Ruby had connections with organized crime figures, adding a layer of intrigue to the conspiracy narrative. However, unraveling the mystery behind choosing to assassinate JFK instead of Bobby, who would later be fatally shot in 1968 by Sirhan Bashara Sirhan, linked to Middle East conflicts, proves challenging for those seeking a straightforward explanation. As noted by Mafia expert Ralph Salerno, who reviewed extensive electronic surveillance of organized crime leaders during the assassination, no suspicious activities were detected at the time, adding a layer of complexity to the conspiracy theories. The Soviets' connection with JFK assassination 
Certainly, Lee Harvey Oswald did spend some time in the USSR. However, connecting the assassination of President John F. Kennedy to the Soviet Union is a notion that has significantly diminished in recent decades. This decline in such thinking is primarily due to the lack of evidence supporting Soviet involvement, considering that, by now, any such evidence would likely have been uncovered. The dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, coincidentally the same year Oliver Stone's film JFK was released, marked a pivotal moment. Despite revelations from declassified KGB files, such as details about Khrushchev's bioweapons facility, Biopreparat, and the secret D6 underground network beneath Moscow, no shred of evidence has emerged connecting the USSR to the JFK assassination. In reality, John F. Kennedy was actively engaged in fostering peace and understanding between the two superpowers. He maintained correspondence with Premier Khrushchev, much of which is available on the State Department's website, and even established a direct telephone line to Moscow. The personal rapport between the two leaders was evident, with Khrushchev once presenting the U.S. government with a dog, appropriately named Pushinka. Interestingly, it turned out there was indeed a Soviet plot related to the JFK assassination. In 1992, Vasily Mitrokin, a KGB archivist, defected to the United Kingdom, bringing with him a trove of official documents amassed over his 30-year career. These documents unveiled a KGB effort to disseminate misinformation, suggesting that the CIA was responsible for JFK's assassination. The KGB went to the extent of forging a letter from Lee Harvey Oswald to CIA officer Everett Howard Hunt, well known for his later involvement in the Watergate burglary, in an attempt to implicate him and the CIA in the assassination, the Cubans' connection with JFK assassination. The speculations surrounding Cuban involvement in the JFK assassination have persisted over the years, Yet a clear consensus on which faction, pro-Castro or anti-Castro Cubans may be responsible, remains elusive. In terms of motive, both of them were allegedly connected to the assassination. For the anti-Castro Cubans, the impetus to make such a plot emerges from the aftermath of the ill-fated 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion. This operation, a CIA-backed coup attempt, had its roots in the Eisenhower administration but became a significant challenge inherited by President John F. Kennedy. The United States disavowed its commitment to the insurgents it had trained when their covert activities were exposed. To make things more complicated, recently uncovered documents reveal the involvement of the Chicago Mafia in training some of these Cuban exiles. Perhaps, Fidel Castro, then President of Cuba, had substantial reasons to hold resentment against the United States government creating a plausible motive for his involvement in a plot against the head of the United States government. Through various agencies like the CIA, the United States government had been relentless in its attempts to assassinate Castro. The Church Committee, established in 1975 to investigate the activities of the CIA, FBI, NSA, and IRS, uncovered evidence of eight CIA-backed plots to assassinate Castro from 1960 to 1965. Former head of Cuban intelligence, Fabian Escalante, claimed in 2006 that over 40 years, Castro had evaded 638 assassination attempts, with 42 occurring during JFK's administration. Adding an intriguing layer to the narrative, Lee Harvey Oswald's connection to Cuba is evident through his founding of a chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans. This affiliation drew the attention of the FBI. Despite the potential motive associated with Oswald's activities, there is no concrete evidence indicating the involvement of any Cuban faction, aside from Oswald's preoccupation with Castro. In fact, up until his untimely death, JFK was actively engaged in efforts to mend the strained relationship with Cuba, a rift that had been exacerbated by the preceding administration. The Secret Society Connection with JFK Assassination The notion that Lee Harvey Oswald might have been involved in an Illuminati-style secret society plotting the assassination of President John F. Kennedy may sound far-fetched, but delving into the peculiar history of Discordianism adds an unexpected twist to this conspiracy theory. In the late 1950s, counterculture hipsters Carrie Thornley and Greg Hill 
embarked on a whimsical endeavor to create a satirical religion, which they aptly named Discordianism. Every religion requires a central text, and Thornley and Hill penned the Principia Discordia, printing its first edition in 1963 using the Xerox machine owned by Jim Garrison, the district attorney of Orleans Parish, Louisiana. Prior to publishing the Principia Discordia, Thornley had completed the manuscript for his novel The Idol Warriors in 1962. This comedic and fictionalized account recounted his experiences in the Marines. The main character, Johnny Shelburne, was inspired by a fellow Marine who had claimed to be a communist and eventually defected to the Soviet Union, none other than Lee Harvey Oswald. Typically, creating a humorous novel about an old communist Marine acquaintance and drafting a fictitious religious text for a satirical cult wouldn't raise eyebrows. But when the Marine you knew, who claimed to be a communist, ends up assassinating the president, and you accidentally copy your cult manifesto on the machine owned by the New Orleans district attorney, a guy really into conspiracy theories and is always seeking to implicate people in the assassination plot. Things get pretty intense. As highlighted in Adam Gorightly's 2014 work, Caught in the Crossfire, Thornley found himself incessantly accused of involvement in the JFK assassination conspiracy. The relentless accusations eventually led Thornley to a state of believing he was an unwitting pawn in someone else's intricate game, the U.S. government connection with JFK assassination. Over the past six decades, numerous books, blogs, and TV specials have implicated virtually every aspect of the United States government in the JFK assassination. Such allegations are profoundly serious and unsettling. The notion that a federal government particularly one that consistently champions freedom as its core principle, would play a role in the assassination of its own leader was, until the 1960s, widely regarded as unthinkable. It is important to note that there exists no clear and compelling evidence linking any segment of the United States government to the specific act of the JFK assassination. To entertain the idea that the government was involved in the assassination is to hinge on the government's lack of complete transparency during the investigation and revelations of other illegal and unethical activities that surfaced in the 1960s. Rather than serving as viable solutions to the murder, these specific conspiracy theories offer a glimpse into the broader issue of the erosion of public trust. This erosion stems from an absence of governmental accountability and transparency. The suggestion that the government may have played a role in the JFK assassination highlights a profound challenge in maintaining public confidence when government actions are shrouded in secrecy and questionable conduct surfaces. Take, for instance, the notion implicating the FBI in JFK's assassination. Advocates of this conspiracy theory highlight fragile connections, such as the FBI's awareness of Oswald and potential harassment, as per Oswald's allegations. Additionally, a memo from John Edgar Hoover is cited, expressing the necessity to convince the public that Oswald is the real assassin. Subsequent revelations about documented FBI activities during this period, including the targeted harassment of Martin Luther King Jr., the covert and illegal operations of COINTELPRO, the provision of information leading to the assassination of Fred Hampton, and Hoover's personal involvement in domestic surveillance of numerous American citizens, as well as the creation of inaccurate posthumous narratives around figures like Viola Liuzzo, significantly tarnished the Bureau's reputation. The repercussions lingered for decades, if not fully dissipating. Some conspiracy theorists proposed that Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson was involved in JFK's assassination. This fringe theory is rooted in the belief that Johnson feared being dropped from the 1964 ticket and that JFK planned to de-escalate the Vietnam War, from which Johnson personally profited. Such an assertion not only tarnishes the memory and legacy of Presidents JFK and Johnson, but led to the History Channel publicly apologizing for broadcasting an episode that outlined this specific conspiracy theory. In a book published in 1968, Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, suggested that the president had privately confided in her just three days before his death, indicating his intention to replace Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson with North Carolina's Terry Sanford as his running mate. 
However, there is no public evidence supporting this claim. On October 31, 1963, President JFK dispelled any rumors of switching running mates. Considering he was in Dallas on November 22 as part of a broader Texas tour to garner support in the state he narrowly won in 1960, largely due to having a Texas senator on his ticket, the idea of replacing him with a North Carolinian seems perplexing. Now, let's turn our attention to the Pentagon Papers. Historians, whether leaning favorably towards Lyndon Baines Johnson or not, widely acknowledge his significant dedication, often described as involving blood, sweat, and tears. Not only to secure the highest position in the country, but also to champion progressive policies, notably the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968. However, an in-depth exploration of the pages leaked by Daniel Ellsberg to the American public unveiled the extent to which Johnson was willing to make sacrifices. These leaked documents brought to light the fact that, under Lyndon Baines Johnson's leadership, the United States government withheld certain truths about the Vietnam War from the American public. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, pushed by the government under false pretenses, granted President Johnson the authority to take any measures he deemed necessary to retaliate and ensure international peace and security in Southeast Asia. During the Johnson administration, the Defense Department adjusted its rationale for prolonging combat in Vietnam, citing a goal of 70% to avoid a humiliating United States defeat. Furthermore, when Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara suggested in 1967 that the United States start withdrawing from Vietnam, Johnson opted to approve increasing the U.S. troop commitment to nearly 550,000. For those inclined towards conspiracy theories, drawing parallels became easier. They connected the controversial July 1937 funding approval orchestrated by then-Congressman Lyndon Baines Johnson for the firm Brown & Root, a significant campaign donor, with the formation of the consortium RMKBRJ in August 1965. This consortium was established to construct naval facilities in Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnam. Similar to how the Pentagon Papers fueled the LBJ Did It narrative, Recent years have witnessed a resurgence of the fringe theory suggesting that the Secret Service accidentally shot President JFK. Initially proposed by ballistics expert Howard Donahue in the pages of the Baltimore Sun in 1977, and popularized by Bonar Menninger's 1992 book, Mortal Error, The Shot That Killed JFK, this theory proposes that the fatal shot was fired by a Secret Service agent with an AR-15 in the car behind the President's limousine. According to the theory, the Secret Service's interference in investigations aimed to conceal its own mistake. This fringe theory tends to resurface whenever tangible evidence of Secret Service malfeasance comes to light, such as during the Sixth Summit of the Americas in 2012, or the revelation of deleted texts amid the January 6, 2021 hearings. Finally, let's turn our attention to the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. Conspiracy theorists often highlight the claim that President Kennedy expressed a desire to splinter the CIA in a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. It's worth noting that this quote first emerged from an anonymous source three years after his death. These theorists also point out that the CIA possessed more information about Lee Harvey Oswald than initially disclosed. Additionally, they bring attention to Alan Dulles, the CIA director until President Kennedy dismissed him following the Bay of Pigs invasion. Interestingly, Dulles later became one of the seven men on the Warren Commission tasked with investigating the assassination. However, the most essential critique of the CIA concerning the JFK assassination isn't based on what we know. It's about what remained unknown. In the early 1960s, nobody, including the White House, had a clear understanding of the CIA's activities. Philip Shannon's 2013 book, A Cruel and Shocking Act, The Secret History of the Kennedy Assassination, recounts a direct inquiry from Bobby Kennedy to then-CIA Director John McCone. Bobby asked McCone point-blank if the CIA had any involvement in JFK's murder, and McCone responded that they weren't involved. The CIA inherited by JFK from the Eisenhower administration was one that even Eisenhower couldn't, or perhaps didn't want to, fully control. During Eisenhower's presidency, 
the CIA had covertly orchestrated coups to overthrow democratically elected leaders in Iran, Operation Ajax, and Guatemala, Operation PB Success. The agency also provided support, including encouragement and sometimes weapons, leading to the deaths of Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and President Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. Bobby Kennedy had first-hand knowledge of the CIA's capabilities, having been directly involved in assassination plots against Fidel Castro. When he reportedly asked the CIA if they were responsible for his brother's death, the alarming aspect wasn't the possibility of the agency's direct involvement. There's no substantial evidence to support that claim. Instead, what troubled him was the realization that the CIA had become so unwieldy and unaccountable that entertaining the idea of their involvement was a cause for concern. Now it's time for our subscribers' pick. You would be amazed after finding out the bizarre things Lee Harvey Oswald's mother did after JFK's assassination. Looking at this photograph, you will notice Lee Harvey Oswald has an uncanny resemblance to his mother, Marguerite Oswald. For a mother whose son was accused of assassinating the 35th President of the United States, you would be wondering what's going on in her mind. Do you think she would believe the rumors about her son were true in the first place? On her quest in fighting financial difficulties, she had to resort to seeking publicity and cash in the years following her son's death, making several revelations regarding the assassination of JFK. At that moment, you could tell she had a motive of defending her son from his actions. Amidst the conspiracy theories behind the assassination of JFK, do you think Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly acted alone or was it a plot by a group of individuals to assassinate the president? Do let us know in the comments section below as we continue with this video. Lee Harvey Oswald connection with JFK assassination. Literally, it is highly probable that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in the assassination of JFK. Contrary to being a mere pawn or a covert operative, Oswald was an individual driven by a personal belief in his own significance. He harbored a deep-seated frustration, lashing out against anyone he perceived as hindering his perceived destiny. Ideologically, he clung to communism, Cuba, and anything that could provide him with a semblance of purpose. On that fateful day, November 22, 1963, Oswald determined that his purpose was to assassinate the President of the United States. This was not an isolated incident. On April 10, 1963, Oswald had previously targeted conservative politician General Edwin Walker, narrowly missing his mark with a shot from the same Carcano rifle he would later employ at the Texas School Book Depository. Subsequently, Jack Ruby, seeking his own sense of purpose, ended Oswald's life with a single pull of the trigger on November 24, 1963. The decisions of these two individuals have spawned six decades of conspiracy theories, often propagated by those who firmly believe they can uncover a mystery that resists acceptance of its straightforward resolution. Accepting the lone actor theory entails acknowledging that no one, not even the President of the United States, is as secure as governmental systems assure us. It requires grappling with the idea that a symbol of hope and a new frontier can be extinguished by an individual armed with a modest rifle purchased for $20, devoid of any intricate conspiracy. It was a moment of chaos, where coincidences aligned to fracture the nation. Many individuals prefer subscribing to conspiracy theories because, in some way, it offers a semblance of control. Believing in conspiracies implies a rule-bound game and a structured system, fostering a sense of safety if one adheres to prescribed norms. Lee Harvey Oswald's Mother Revelations In the aftermath of JFK's assassination, the spotlight turned to Lee Harvey Oswald's childhood, with particular focus on his mother, Marguerite Oswald. Her role in the narrative has been central, and over the years, various perspectives have emerged. While Marguerite's statements about Lee Harvey Oswald have become a tantalizing source for those exploring conspiracy theories, some view her claims about the president's assassination as evidence of opportunism and manipulation. Others, taking a more empathetic stance, argue that her perplexing behavior reflects mental distress and profound grief. The official confirmation of President John F. Kennedy's death marked a pivotal moment. But right from the start, 
Marguerite Oswald's reaction to both the president's and her son's deaths seemed disconnected from reality. In interviews with reporters, her reactions seemed to pivot towards self-interest and financial concerns, creating an impression of her as a cold-hearted hustler. Shortly after Lee Harvey Oswald's arrest, Marguerite attempted to secure a ride to the police station by contacting the local Fort Worth newspaper, the Star-Telegram. The ensuing conversation, recounted by reporter Bob Schieffer, became infamous. Schieffer observed that Marguerite displayed minimal concern for the president's assassination, being overwhelmingly preoccupied with financial matters. Worst of all, she lamented that Lee Harvey Oswald's wife would gain more sympathy than her in the aftermath of the tragedy. This incident was not an isolated occurrence. Following Jack Ruby's shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald, Marguerite voiced her dissatisfaction that Jackie Kennedy had not offered condolences. She remarked, After all, we love Lee just as much as she loved her husband. We are human beings too. I'm indignant at her, and I resent her thinking we're not as good as she is. Such insensitive remarks continued to shape public perceptions of Marguerite Oswald during the days that followed. In conjunction with numerous conspiracy theorists, Marguerite Oswald publicly asserted that her son, Lee Harvey Oswald, was innocent of any wrongdoing. In a 1963 interview, she claimed to have overheard him persistently proclaim his innocence during interrogations, and she embraced this assertion as an undeniable fact. According to her, I am going to work much harder to prove my son's innocence because to me, it was an injustice. When the Warren Commission assembled to investigate the assassination, Marguerite testified, contending that her son was a scapegoat and a CIA agent. Despite presenting documents that she deemed crucial evidence, Chief Justice Earl Warren challenged her for not substantiating why she believed Lee Harvey Oswald worked for the government and failing to supply relevant evidence. The question arises, did Marguerite genuinely believe her own claim? Her son and Lee's half-brother, John Pick, believed it was merely a money-making scheme. On the other hand, Marguerite exhibited signs of paranoia possibly indicating genuine fear of a conspiracy. She adamantly refused to leave Texas, asserting that the government would not permit it. While never facing any criminal charges, Marguerite Oswald's bizarre claims about her son evolved over the years. In the 1960s, magazine writer Jean Stafford interviewed her for a book titled A Mother in History. At times, Marguerite staunchly argued that her son was an innocent scapegoat, However, during the extensive interview for the book, she put forth an entirely different and more unusual conspiracy theory, suggesting that her son had done John F. Kennedy a favor by attacking him. She stated, And as we all know, President Kennedy was a dying man. So I say it is possible that my son was chosen to shoot him in a mercy killing for the security of the country. And if this is true, it was a fine thing to do, and my son is a hero. The funeral of Lee Harvey Oswald unfolded as a peculiar and unconventional event, marked by Marguerite Oswald's unique approach, transforming it into an unusual form of publicity. As expected, the actual funeral service lacked a significant number of mourners, prompting the family to request journalists to step in as pallbearers. Despite the limited attendance, the event garnered press coverage, providing Marguerite with an opportunity to extol her son's virtues. In a poignant moment during the service, the grieving mother directly addressed television cameras proclaiming, Lee Harvey Oswald, my son, even after his death, has done more for his country than any other living human being. Post-service, Marguerite meticulously chronicled the funeral in a memoir titled, Aftermath of an Execution. This concise booklet not only encapsulates visual documentation of the day, but also includes anecdotes and quotes from individuals present at the funeral offering a personal and reflective account of the unconventional ceremony. Marguerite Oswald engaged in an array of money-making endeavors that capitalized on the aftermath of the president's assassination. From selling Lee Harvey Oswald's clothing to marketing recordings of his letters from Russia, which she personally narrated, her ventures were extensive and often unconventional. Notably peculiar was her sale of autographed business cards bearing her name, peddling them on a street corner at $5 each. In a particularly unconventional moment, 
She even expressed a willingness to sell Lee Harvey Oswald's tombstone. While many viewed this opportunistic behavior as distasteful, Marguerite maintained a different perspective. She defended her actions to reporters, asserting, This woman was left with no one and no money, yet she took the bull by the horns and found a way to survive and support herself. Marguerite's resilience has endured, evident even during her interaction with the Warren Commission. In expressing her anxiety to the judge, she emphasized the importance of retaining the pictures she submitted as evidence, citing their potential value as a source of income. She laid emphasis, saying, You must understand that these are very valuable pictures, sir. I am having people wanting rights to a book, and these pictures are very, very valuable to me. In essence, the narrative behind Marguerite Oswald shows us a complicated picture of a woman dealing with the aftermath of her son's part in a big historical event. Looking at what she did makes us think about how people might do unusual things to survive when facing tough times. Even if those things seem strange, it's a reminder of how individuals might try different ways to make a living during challenging situations. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.